When any group gets together, the whole question of leadership comes up because you can't just have a group, each one doing his own thing. You need leadership to guide the group. So what kind of leadership are we talking about? Let me begin by saying a little more about apostles because this word has reappeared in the last 30 years. I guess you've heard it here. People are calling themselves apostles or calling other people apostles. There are in the Bible five kinds of apostle, three of which are no longer around. And we need to get this clear. The first kind of apostle was unique. There was only one of his kind, and that's Jesus himself, who is called the chief apostle. Because an apostle is someone who is sent from one place to another to do something. The basic meaning of apostolo, the Greek word, is to send. So an apostle is always sent from somewhere to somewhere to do something. And Jesus was sent from heaven to the earth to save us. But apostles never work alone. There is no case of an apostle in the New Testament working by himself. So Jesus was also joined by the Holy Spirit when he was 30 years of age, and together they engaged in an apostolic ministry to the world. Then there are the 12 apostles, and they are unique also. Their qualification was that they had known Jesus before he died and known him after he rose. Therefore, they could be primary witnesses to his resurrection. They could swear in a court of law, I knew that man before he died, and I knew him after he rose again. They were apostles of the resurrection. And when Judas um, was cut out of the 12, they had to find another number 12. And they found Matthias who also had known Jesus before and after. There are no apostles today, because there are not of this kind, because there is no one else who, around who has witnessed Jesus before and after. Then there is another kind of apostle. Again, there's only one of this kind, and that's Paul. And he was unique, not in the way the others were, but he was unique in having met the risen Christ and been commissioned by him and being a writer of scripture. There are no apostles today who write scripture. We can't add to the word of God. It's closed. So it's very important that we don't have a loose leaf Bible and add things that people have said today to God's word. Uh, so we've dealt with three kinds of apostles, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the twelve sent to be witnesses of the resurrection, and Paul. He says himself he was born out of due time, that he didn't fit, that he was unique, the last of all, I even I, the last of all. Many people have said he should have been number twelve, in place of Judas. No. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the 12 as unique, and he's different. But he also says, I'm the last. Then we come to two kinds of apostle today who are still around, and we need both. I've already mentioned the apostle who is a church planter and whose job it is to break new ground. In a sense, such an apostle is a bit of a prophet, a bit of an evangelist, a bit of a pastor, a bit of a teacher. He is uniquely gifted to plant new churches, but again, he never does it on his own. Every time in the New Testament, an apostle goes with at least one other person. 
when Jesus sent out the 12 and the 70, they went out two by two. And there's always strength in not being a one-man lone ranger. And I just imagine the, the 12, when they were sent out, Jesus said, uh, now go out, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and then tell them the kingdom's come. You notice first that they have to demonstrate the kingdom and then declare it. They show it first and then they talk about it. And I can imagine them going out two by two and two of the disciples coming to a town and saying to each other, I hope we don't meet a demon-possessed man. <laughs> and then suddenly there in the marketplace, there's a crazy guy, obviously demon-possessed, and here are James and John. And James says to John, well, you do the first one and I'll do the second. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll just be around the corner praying for you while you deal with him. <laughs> I know that's how they went out. They went out not believing they could do it. And they came back so excited. They said, even the demons do what we tell them. They'd never seen that before. And Jesus said, cool it, cool it. Get excited because your name is written in heaven, not because the demons are subject to you. But that betrays that they went out in fear and trembling, came back rejoicing. Well, now, apostles as church planters are here now. And I could introduce you to some outstanding. I've got a friend in India who's an apostle to India. He's planting churches all over India. I uh, had a friend who died recently in uh, Nigeria, was planting a church a day in West Africa. He began by raising six people from the dead. And um, my memory is failing, I can't think of his name, you would know him. But he's a church planter and just has the gift for planting a church. Now we need apostles like that who are sent to plant churches, but always part of a team. And the fifth kind of apostle is very ordinary and takes all that aura away from the word apostle. Anybody sent from one place to another to do something for the Lord is an apostle. That's the widest sense. For example, there was a man called Epaphroditus who was sent by the church in Philippi to be Paul's housekeeper in Rome because he was under house arrest. And Paul refers to him in his letter to the Philippians, says, thank you for sending your apostle Epaphroditus. So any Christian sent anywhere by a church to do something somewhere else is an apostle. So it's a very flexible word, but the main uh, word for today is church planter. I have found, however, that often church planters, once they've planted a group, set themselves up as a bishop over them. And they change from being an apostolos to an episkopos. And I think that's a mistake. <laughs> but I'm afraid there are too many church planters today very quickly settle down and take oversight over the churches they've planted. That's not biblical. Translocal oversight is unknown in the New Testament. I mean by that, oversight is always local. And it's very important that it is, that we don't build up a hierarchy. That's what has happened to so many churches, so that you get bishops, archbishops, and it just goes up. And the word arch or archo in Greek means rule. So you get a pyramid of rulers. And that's, in a time of persecution, fatal. Because all the persecutors need to do is get the hold of the top of the pyramid, and they've got the whole lot. So a New Testament church is able to survive persecution by being local, and not by being part of a pyramid organization. Now, Episcopos 
is a local function in the New Testament and it's from that that we get our word Episcopal or as it's translated in some New Testament versions, Bishop. The difference is that in the New Testament you had many bishops to one church, whereas later the church had one bishop to many churches and that's a complete switch. The early church began to copy the organization of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was arranged exactly that, in a pyramid or hierarchy of power. And alas, the church copied that. And to this day, the Pope uses the old emperor's titles so that the thinking is still emperor or imperial. One of his titles is Pontifex Maximus, which literally in Latin means the big church, big bri bridge builder. And the Pope still uses that, still wears the robes of the old Roman Emperor. Any church that is organized like that with somebody at the top is so vulnerable to persecution because they only need to take the top off and the whole thing collapses. So oversight, episkopos, is local. Now I'm going to test your Bible knowledge. There is one man in the New Testament who has three of the major functions. He is called episkopos, apostolos, and diakonos, or deacon. Only one man in the whole New Testament is called all three. Now, I think some of you know, you know, and you know. But for the rest of you, I'll give you five euros if you can tell me. <laughs> and he's a very well-known man, one of the best known in the New Testament. And he combined those three functions. Apostolos, Episcopos, Diagnos. Come on, shout out some answers. Paul? Paul? Paul. No. Very well known. Have another guess. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. You're on TV. The world's going to see you make this. <laughs> Give me an another try. Philippus. No. Peter. No. John. No. Stephen. No. Very well known. <laughs> I'll have to tell you what I. Judas Iscariot, <laughs> and you would never have guessed, would you? <laughs> and he was called Episcopos, Apostolos, and Diaconos, all in one chapter, Acts chapter 1. But you'd have, probably have to read it in Greek to see that. Well, now, Apostolos is a man who's traveling, sent out to plant churches. But Episcopos means overseer or oversight, and that's always local in the New Testament. And the Episcopos usually has another title, Presbyteros, from which we get the term Presbyterian, but it actually means elder or older. Now that doesn't mean, as we shall see in a moment, that elders have to be old men, but they do have to be more mature than the other Christians in the church. And so at local level, the New Testament churches had two groups of people, elders and deacons. Elders were called both presbyteros and episcopos, but they were called elders. And you'll find that when Paul writes a letter, he writes to the saints in a place together with the elders and deacons. And it is this twofold structure which characterized the New Testament churches. And they were for two quite different purposes. The elders were to supervise the church, and the deacons were to serve the church. Therefore, the elders were to look after the spiritual needs of the church, and the deacons were to look after the practical needs of the church. And because we are physical as well as spiritual, we have both spiritual and practical needs. 
So, for example, deacons would look after the widows and their needs, women who'd lost their men. And we appointed in our church a deacon for the widows. He was a builder and he could replace broken glass in the window and drain pipes that had gone wrong and uh, taps that were leaking. And he did this for the widows and he helped them to fill in their income tax returns. And in a wonderful way, he was full of the Holy Spirit, this man, gentle, loving, and he looked after all the widows in our church, things that normally they would have asked their husband to do. And he did them now for the widows. He was a real deacon with a lovely serving spirit. So we need these two kinds of people in a local church. We need supervisors and servants. One group looking after the spiritual direction of the church, the other group looking after the practical needs. And uh, practical needs, even if you rent a building for worship, there are many practical things to do every Sunday to put the music instruments in, to see to the lighting and the heating and all practical needs because we live in bodies. In, if somebody says to me, it's nice to meet you in the flesh, I always reply, I'm usually in the flesh. <laughs> because we are fleshly people and our flesh needs looking after just as much as our spirits. So we have this clear division of labor in a New Testament church between elders who supervise and deacons who serve. Now I want to talk about the elders particularly because they are the key. You're not really a New Testament church until you have elders. And if you study the book of Acts, on Paul's first missionary journey, they planted churches in Lystra and Derbe and Iconium. On his second journey, they went back and appointed elders in every one of the groups they'd left behind. Or you take the letter to Titus, Paul says, Titus, I left you in Crete to appoint elders in every place. And that's when a group of Christians has become a church. It marks a definite transition when you have a group of elders who are responsible for the people and people who are responsible to the elders. However, many churches have suffered from not being careful about appointing elders. And when you appoint the wrong men, then things go terribly wrong. The right <coughs> men... Now, the first thing to notice about elders is you never have one. You appoint elders in every place. It is a corporate leadership, and that's crucial you can't run a church with one leader, one elder, because one of the elders' main responsibilities is discipline within the fellowship. And if one man tries to do that, the result is disaster. He will be blamed, he will be criticized. If one man tries to discipline a church, I've seen it happen, and it really causes chaos, catastrophe, it can break a church up in two. So we need, I believe, at least three so that uh, you've got a corporate body who are going to supervise whatever happens in that church. Now we're given the qualifications. In 1 Timothy we've got a list of the qualifications for elders. And woe betide us if we don't take note of them. One of them, for example, is to study the man's family and see if he's able to supervise his own children. Otherwise, don't appoint him. The Bible says if he can't handle his own children, he can't handle the church because it's a family and he'll be a kind of father figure in the church. And if he can't put his own family right, then he's not going to be able to put the church right. That balance of love and discipline within the home 
You look for that first. You look for a man who's not greedy for money. Now that's a strange thing to say, but I'm afraid it's a temptation common to men that they want to get on in business and a man who is greedy for money, don't touch him for an elder because he's got mixed motives in his heart. Well, go through all those. Now you notice that in fact Paul was appointing elders one year after they were converted. So the idea it's got to be a, a Christian with a long gray beard and been a Christian 40 years, that's out. They went back to see which of their converts had made more progress than the others, was developing and maturing more quickly. And that was a qualification to be an elder, not to be an old man, but to be mature and more mature than the others they're going to look after. So they were appointing one-year-old Christians as elders. I just put that in so that we don't think it's got to be a lot of old men who've been Christians 40 years. But Paul does add, but don't lay hands quickly on anyone. Take your time. Now, of course, the question arises, who appoints them? Let's face that head on. Certainly, those who've planted a church will have a hand in appointing elders. But will they do it by themselves? There's a very interesting Greek word used for appointed. When Paul went back to appoint elders, or Titus went to appoint elders in Titus, the word Paul uses is hand raise. It's a Greek word, the first part of it means hand, and the second part of it means raise. And that means this. And that means voting. Now that's a very interesting word to use. Paul didn't come back and say, I appoint you as an elder, I appoint you as an elder. He did something that used the word hand raise. It means that the people also shared in choice of elders. And from then on, some elderships I know are almost self-appointed. They don't consult the church. They just say, we have appointed another elder. And they do everything bar burn white smoke out of the chimney to indicate it, as they do for a new pope. <laughs> but that's not scriptural either. In scripture, the members of the church have responsibilities. And this is a very important point. Let me tell you how we did it in our church, trying to be true to everything scripture says. We, of course, were an established church in the sense we'd been going for some time. So we didn't have an apostle still planting us. So, but we had a group of elders. And either the elders or anybody in the church could say, what about this person for an elder? We could bring a name. The members could bring a name. We then spent three months over selecting. It was never competitive. We never said we had a vacancy for an elder. So we'll consider these three names and you vote on one. That's democracy. That's elections. We didn't have elections. What we did, the first month, we told all the members, this name has come to our notice to be considered for an elder. And we said, spend the next month praying about this, thinking about it. The second monthly meeting, we said, now let's have a full open discussion about this person. You can say anything about him. He didn't come to that meeting. And we had a report for the meeting from his place of work and his employers. The Bible says to do that. A good report from outsiders. And we discussed the man fully. And then we said, next month we will decide. And then the following month we said, 
we want at least four out of every five of you to say you recognize this man as an elder given to you by God. And if it was less than that, usually very much less, if it wasn't right, we said, right, we don't go ahead. We never went ahead on 51%. And usually it was 90, 95. There were always some people who are not in the spirit. In other words, the sheep were recognizing the shepherd. Because sheep will only follow a shepherd they recognize and know and recognize his leadership. Now all this meant, and this is a very important point I'm making, that we had meetings of members only. And I have found that's a key to being a New Testament church. If all you have are public meetings, then the elders do too much and they take the decisions. So once a month, we had a meeting for members only. And it may sound dull, members business meeting, but my wife told me recently, she said the one thing I miss most when we're not geared into leading a church, she said the one thing I miss most is the monthly members business meeting. Because those were the times when we sought the Lord, when we did the Lord's business in the Lord's way, and with the elders together and the members together, we really listened for the Lord. And any member could bring a word from the Lord to the whole church, and many of them did. And we would test it and weigh and judge it, and then do it if it was of the Lord. So I believe in open government in a church. We'll move on in the next talk to discipline, for example. And in discipline, every member needs to be involved. Paul writing to Corinth about a man who was disgracing the church by having sex with his mother, and it was known, and people were saying, there's Christianity for you. And Paul said, you've got to discipline this man, and you've got to put him out of fellowship. And he didn't say that to the elders. He said it to the whole church. He said, you've all got to be part of this. And they put him out. And he repented of that. And at the next letter Paul wrote to them, he said, I hear he's repented. And he said, listen carefully, the majority of you put him out of fellowship. Now all of you welcome him back in. So the whole church had been involved in a matter of discipline. That mustn't be a public meeting. It must be members' meeting. Well, I'll continue the next talk with that because discipline is a mark of the true church.